Today's staff, we're going to learn is Yuvamot Samach Dalet. Today's staff is sponsored by Hyphen Hufen Parent in honor of her daughter's teacher, Karen Moss. This dedication is in honor of my daughter's teacher in day school and tutor for her bat mitzvah, which took place this past Rosh Chodesh. Today's staff is also sponsored by Alana Cutler in loving memory of her mother, Marsha Lerner, Malka Leah by Yitzchak Hillel, with appreciation for the love of learning she inspired. Okay, we're going to start with uh, the bottom. Uh, before we get to the bottom of yesterday's stuff, I promised we would go a little bit into depth into this interesting issue that we saw about um, Ben Azai and how we perceive Ben Azai, where basically the, the rabbis critique him and say, you know, it's very nice that you have this great drasha about the importance of pre Rivia, but you don't keep to what you said. And they're clearly critical of him, even though he claims that the bottom line, right, that the last line we hear, is his words where he basically says, you know, well, my heart goes after Torah and that's my, you know, that's my destiny. So first of all, there's a bunch of things. The Rambam says that, um, the Rambam basically says here that if you can look at, it's in Hilchot uh, Ishut, Perek Tevav, I think it's Halacha Gimel. He says basically that if somebody is like Ben Azai, he even quotes, is like Ben Azai, and Chashkan of Shoba Torah, so lo no se avon, he's not punished for it. So the question is, how do we understand the Ramam? Does the Ramam think it's a bad thing to do, but he's not punished for it? Or does he think it's really okay for, you know, unique people to be like this? So first of all, there's all sorts of things said about this. Some people claim, you know, there is no one, the Ritva says there's nobody nowadays like Ben Azai, so don't try to do this yourself. Some people say there never was anybody like him, okay? The, the, he was unique, and we know he was one of the four that Nechnesu the Pardes. And Rabbi Tzadok HaKolmi Lublin, basically, he basically says that he was actually, the reason, if you remember, Ben Azai, he sits the mate, right? He died going into the Pardes, and they say that it was one of the problems with him was that he didn't get married. So there's a lot to be said about Ben Azai and obviously a lot of different opinions about whether what he did was really okay or wasn't really okay. Um, so now we're going to move on. Tanu Rabbanan from the end of yesterday's stuff, the last few words. yomar, and when it rests, you should say, Shuva Hashem Revot of Israel. Return the Revot, which is 10,000s, right? Plural, 10,000s, and Alfe, the thousands of the Jewish people. So they dash in this pasuk to say, in a minute we'll connect it to Puru Revu. Since it says Rivavot and Alfei, this pasuk teaches you that God's presence is only going to rest on the people when there's two Rivavot, which is 20,000, and 2,000, so 22,000 people. So therefore, what does it have to do with Puru Revia? Let's say, for instance, if the Jewish people numbered 22,190, uh, no, 20, sorry, it would be 22,000 plus 2,000. Why did I say, Shnel, right, Shnel, the famous Shnei Ravot is 24,000. So let's say they were 23,999. And you didn't have any children. If you were the one Right. This is like the importance of every person makes a difference. You be the one that basically caused the Shekhinah not to rest. So basically you'd be responsible for not causing the Shekhinah to rest upon the Jewish people. Right. God's presence. So, Abba Hanan Amal Mushum Rabbi Eliezer, Chayav Mita. OK, he gives a different thing that anyone who doesn't do, doesn't create, have children. Again, we're talking about people who can and don't. Chayav Mita is liable for the death penalty. Shanemal, how do we get this? Again, no one's going to kill him in a court, but saying it's you're worthy of dying. This is like the Shofech Dam Adam Badam Tamo Yishafech, as we saw yesterday, because it says, Ubanim lo hayulahem. What's the context? Right? So now it says, okay, so before I even read the next part, I'm going to tell you where this pasuk is. It's in Nadav Avihu. Remember Nadav and Avihu on the big day of the Miluim, right? They come into the temple, right? Everyone says, right. Nobody really knows why they died. Most people say because they brought an Eish Zara into the temple, but there's a whole slew of explanations. Some people said they went in drunk, right? There's a whole list and all of them are kind of darting out from the verses. So this one says, okay, when they were sacrificing an Eish Zara. So it could be because they sacrificed a foreign fire or maybe it's just describing what they were doing at the time. 
Lifnei Hashem before God, b'mid bar Sinai in the desert of Sinai, u'banim lo hayu lahem. They didn't have any children. Ve'yechehen elazar v'yitamar u'panar u'navihem. Now you might say, they didn't have children. The point is, therefore nobody replaced them, and Elazar and Itamar, their brothers, were the main ones with Aaron because there was no one to replace them. But the Drasha says, because they didn't have children, they were punished. Okay, that's an, an interesting creative answer as to what they were punished for, what their sin was. Um, so therefore, the Gemara says, ha, ayulahem banim, lo metu. And here you can infer, if they did have sons, they wouldn't have died. Achirim obrim, others say, right, achirim is usually Rabbi Meir, Ah, he says, just like we said before about from the river vote here. Now that said only if the Jews were in a particular situation where they were short one body to get the Shekhinah to the rest, then you'd be responsible. But this pursuit comes to teach you in general that you're responsible for causing the Shekhinah to leave the Jewish people. Okay, this is in Bereshit Yud Zayin. I promise to commit, right? I will be your God, you and your children after you. So what do they say here? If you have children after, then the Shechina will rest. Right? God's presence will only rest on trees and, and stones. Okay, meaning it will have nothing to rest upon. Okay, before we continue, I just want to kind of say a general statement here, which is they're being very harsh about anyone who doesn't keep up this mitzvah. But on the other hand, if they, they weren't harsh, Right, you could see why they need to encourage people to have children. Right? It's not easy to have children. It's a financial burden. And if the Jewish, like, if you think about these things, especially the Shechina, what they're basically saying is for Jewish continuity, you have to have children, right? If you don't continue your people, then you'll basically die out. So you could see why they're stressing it, although even though it might sound a little bit harsh toward anybody who doesn't actually keep this mitzvah. Okay. Mishnah. We're continuing on with this topic. We're going to actually make a little bit of mention today about um, women. Are they obligated in Priya Although that topic will really attack much more when we get to the Mishnah on Samachayam Lubet, which says, talks about it directly. Mishnah. Nasa Isha. Now we get to a difficult situation. A man marries a woman. He lives with her for 10 years and she, they don't have children. He can't just sit there and say, okay, I just won't do the mitzvah. What does he need to do? He needs to take action. So the mission doesn't yet say what the action is, or it doesn't actually say. It does say, shot if he divorces her, which sounds like it's a possibility. Rashi says there's basically two tracks. One is, O Yigarshana, the first Rashi on the page. Ela O Yigarshana, either he divorces her, so he can marry someone else. O Yisa where he takes a second wife. Okay, there's even people who say, there's Rishonim who claim that even once Rabbeinu Gershom came in and made this takana in the, in the 11th century, that men can't marry more than one wife, this overrides it, okay? If a person is in this predicament, they're allowed to marry more than one wife. Not everybody agreed, but some people said his takana was not instituted for a situation like this. So the sources later talk about it, that he might be forced to divorce her, okay? That doesn't say so in the mission, just to be clear. Never says he's forced to divorce her. I, I think often people think, oh, well, they blame the wife for this. It, it's not that they blame the wife, and I'm going to prove to you that in another second. Um, but what I want to point out is, first of all, the Ramah says, now we don't force the husband to divorce. He can if he wants to, but we don't force him to. And, and we don't really do that anymore. Um, and the other thing, what else did I want to, oh, Daf Mishalahen, yeah, exactly, thank you. Daf Mishalahen is all about this, and they go into it, they bring a really nice midrash also about a couple that couldn't have children, and how, how much love there was between them, and anyway, it's a nice story, so if you want to listen to Daf Mishalahen, you can. So there's sources on all sides of the spectrum here, but I wanted to just point out that this isn't like, oh, my wife can't give me children, so I'm moving on, okay? And also, this doesn't apply in a case where it's clear that you know, we'll get to the Eretz Yisrael, it doesn't apply in a case where it's clear that one of them or the other had, a, had an issue, that it was their issue that was causing it. Then it becomes clear that then you can divorce earlier, really, if you know it's clear one of them, well, it's more for the, for the, for the husband to have children. The woman is not exactly commanded in Priyar Reveal, though we will talk about that more tomorrow. Um, okay, so, Nasa, so the case here is where we don't really know. We don't see any particular issue. We don't really know who's, who's sort of at fault for this. Also, you're going to see that their whole approach is also that, um, that 
it's God punishing them also. And then the question is who's being punished. You'll see it's kind of interesting. I think it goes against what you might've thought is the situation here. So this, I, like, this is a good example of where you have certain perceptions in your head if you've heard about this before. And when you see this, so you'll see it's not exactly the way your perceptions might be. Again, I have no idea what your perceptions are. I'm just assuming that you might think, oh yeah, it's the wife. That's why the man can divorce her and he can move on because obviously she's got an issue, but that's clearly not what's going on. So we'll see that right now. Gersha, if he divorces her, she can go marry somebody else because we don't assume that it's her problem right away. They say it, right? It could be just this relationship wasn't working to have children, but it could be if they divorce, we'll be able to have children with someone else and she'll be able to have children with someone else. Um, and the second one can also stay married to her for 10 years. He doesn't have to say, oh, look, after five years, it's clear she's not having children. She didn't have children with the first. She's clearly not having children with me. Must be her issue. No, he has to wait the 10 years. Vivi Pila, and if she miscarries, Mona Mishashi Pila. We don't, we don't count that as if she didn't get pregnant. No, she was able to get pregnant, so we only start counting from the miscarriage. Right? We know there's women who, who can get pregnant but have issues carrying the baby to full term, and we have women who have issues getting pregnant. Right? There's different problems that could arise. We don't combine the two. We basically say, right, that's one thing and that's something else. Tanu Rabbanon. Nasaisha. So now the Gemara is going to bring a bright and we're going to go much more in depth into this topic. Okay, he can divorce her, but he has to give her a ketubah, meaning she doesn't forfeit her ketubah money. Okay, this statement can be understood in two different ways. This could be coming to understand why he divorces her or why she gets her ketubah money. Okay, so either it depends where you put the stress on the verse. Shema lozacha libanot mimena. Maybe he's not having a child with her, and that's why he can divorce her and go marry someone else. Or Shema lozacha. Maybe he wasn't zoche libanot mimena. Maybe it was his fault and not her fault, and that's why she gets her too. But we don't penalize her and say, "Oh, look, you couldn't give him what he needed because it's not necessarily her fault." Maybe it's he that was lozoche. Okay, we're going to see this reading later in the Gemara. Even though we don't have proof for this, there is a mention for this in the Torah. Now, it never says in the Torah you have to divorce your wife after, or you can divorce your wife after 10 years, but there is a remez for this. What is that? Right? What happens? The beginning of that verse is Sarai takes Hagar three. She gives her as a pilegesh to Abraham. Notice, by the way, they don't get divorced, right? He takes another wife or a concubine and he has children with her. That happens 10 years after he got to Eretz Canaan. So you learn a few things from this, right? It was exactly what you were saying before, Becky. Because if you live abroad, that doesn't count. Only in Israel, only years in Israel count for this. By the way, it could be understood in two ways. It could be understood as, well, since, right, the truth is no, that wouldn't work. Anyway, it sounds like it's saying really only in Israel, because the assumption is if you're in Chutzlar, it's okay. Don't say anything bad for all you people living in Chutzlaretz, but it seems to be saying that maybe because you're living in Chutzlaretz, that's why you're not having children. In other words, if you're living in Israel, that's the real test. Does it have to do with you or not? Um, so they say lefiha, and then they add all sorts of other things. The basic idea here is there could be some external factor affecting why you're not having children. Lefiha chalahu oshachatahi, if one of them is sick, oshnehem chabushim bebeir asurim, or they were both in jail, ain olimo. Okay, if they were separated because one was in jail or if, or theoretically, some people say even if they were both in jail together and able to have relations in jail, just being in jail could affect how you're doing things and therefore might affect your ability to conceive. So those, so we take those off of the count of the 10 years. Why do we learn from Yitzchak? Why do we learn from Avra? He was 40 when he married Rivka. He was 60 when he gave birth to them. So when she gave birth to them. So now, what do you see? It took him 20 years. And he didn't leave Israel at all. He, we all know Yitzchak always stayed in Israel. So why don't we learn from him? So I'm a lay. Yitzchak akol haya. He had, it was his problem. And that's why he didn't divorce her. And what did he, he pray to God to fix his issue? Okay, next. They say, okay, wait a minute. If you're going to say Yitzchak was at court, and that's why he could wait 20 years. Well, and he didn't wait 20 years. Avram also was barren. It was his problem. He was, he was infertile. So they say, no, how, how do we know he's infertile? We're going to see that later. 
No, it's not 100% clear, but it's a, it's a drasha. So they say, okay, why did it say Yitzchak ben Shishim Shana? And it's one option is to say Yitzchak ben Shishim Shana is coming to tell you, oh, it took him 20 years, so therefore you can also wait 20 years. But they're saying, no, no, no. The reason why we were told he was 60 comes for a whole different reason. You might remember this from Megillah, for those who learned Megillah. We needed to know that he was 60 years old for Rabbi Chiyabar Abba. Why? Rabbi Chiyabar Abba Amar Rabbi Yechanan, Lama nimnu shnotav shal Yishmael, kedei liyachis bem shnotav shal Yaakov. Okay, there's a very famous drasha about the years. Okay, I'm going to share screen now and show you this whole thing, which is, how do we get, why, why did they tell us that Yishmael died when he was 137 years old? What is it, right? We don't care about when Yishmael died. The whole reason is to tell you the years of Yaakov, and eventually we're going to get to that we're missing 14 years in his life, and those 14 years must be that he learned in the yeshiva of Shem and Ever. Okay, that's what we're going to basically get to. So Avram was 86 when he married Hagar at Yishmael, ben right Avraham. Avram ben me'achanabi balelo Yitzchak ben So basically, he was 86 when Yishmael was born. He was 100 when Yitzchak was born. That means... There's 14 years between Yishmael and Yitzchak. Okay, that's the first thing. You, if then, therefore, if, if Yitzchak was ben shishim shana otan, how old was Yishmael? He was 74 when Yaakov was born. So the 74 years between Yaakov and Yishmael, why is this important? Because, so after it tells us that Elosh Nechaya Yishmael, they were 137 years. So now we're going to learn, Haya Yaakov Avinu b'sha'ashin b'erech me'aviv ben shishim b'shalosh shana. This was all to tell you that yes, Yaakov left his father's house. He was 63 years old. How do we know? Because it says Esav, at the same time that Yaakov runs away from Esav after the whole sealing of the bracha, Esav sees that Yaakov got the bracha. He leaves. He goes to Yishmael. He marries Machlach by Yishmael. Now, right to set. If it says by Yishmael, what? Obviously, she was the, bro- the sister of Nivayot because they were both sim- you know, siblings, sons of Yishmael, or the sons and daughters of Yishmael. So why does it mention Nivayot in this context? Right? We've been talking about this all the time, about the father marrying off the daughter. Yishmael must have betrothed her, but by the time the marriage came along, the brother was involved in the marriage and not the father because Yishmael must have died. So basically, Yishmael dies when Yaakov leaves the house. That's how we get to the fact that he was 63 years old because we just do simple math. 137 minus 74 is 63. So he was 63, and that's why we need Yishmael to tell us that. Now, why is it important to know he was 63? Because if we continue to do the math, Yaakov gives birth to Yosef 14 years after he gets to Beit Lavan. How do we know? Because it says, remember, he worked seven years for Leah and then seven years for Rachel, really all for Rachel, but in the end, right, he has to work seven years. And then it says, when he goes after the 14 years are over, he goes to leave. Now, what does it say? It was right when Yosef was born. So Yosef is born 14 years later, so that would presumably make Yaakov 77. Then what happens to Yosef? He was ben shloshim shana, according to the Pasuk Amdolif Ne Paro, which means that when Yosef got to Mitzrayim and stands in front of Paro, Yaakov would have been 107. And then it says, Kizesh Natayim Arab when Yaakov comes to Mitzrayim, it's two years of famine, which means there were seven plentiful years. There were two years of famine. That would put Yaakov, it would be nine years later, from when Yosef got to Mitzrayim, nine years later, Yaakov comes down to Mitzrayim, he will be 116. And what does it say when he meets Paro? Vayomer Paro Yaakov, kama yimei shnei chayecha, vayomer Yaakov Paro, yimei shnei megurai, shloshim umat shanam, 130. He's supposed to be 116. So from there you learn that for 14 years after he left the house, he was in Beit Ever. And only after that did he go do the 20 years in the house of Lavan. Okay, and then it took him two years to get back. That would be 99. Anyway, that's another thing that they're counting other years. But the point is that we're missing 16 years. And those 16 years are clearly the 16 years of, um, where he, uh, sorry, the 14 years are missing. The 14 years are the 14 years he must have been learning in yeshiva. Okay, so basically he doesn't get to get lava when he's 77. He gets there 14 years later. And then everything is pushed off, 14 years. So now we're going to go back and we're going to... Um, Get back to our topic. What was this all coming to teach us? That the 60 years of Yitzchak can't be coming to teach you, wait 20 years before you, before you think to move on and divorce your wife or go marry another woman because of Yitzchak. No, we don't learn it. That 40 and 60 is brought to, the, sorry, the 60 is brought to teach you something else. Yitzchak Avinu Akol Hayam. 
how do we know this? How do we know that it was his issue and not hers? And then you're going to see it was actually both of theirs, but, or the truth is, yeah. But anyway, it was also, he had an issue. In other words, again, once you say he had an issue, you also explain, well, then he didn't need to go marry someone else. Although they said that doesn't prove anything because Abraham had the same problem. But anyway, why, how do we know that? It says he prayed opposite his wife. It doesn't say he prayed for his wife. For his wife, it doesn't say, but opposite her. From here, you see they were both, they both had issues having children. Okay, so here we're going to see it's both Yitzchak and his wife, but that's that was why they were trying to claim it wasn't necessarily that he needed to divorce her because he had the issue as well. Well, then it's it's very strange that it says, God in the end answers Yitzchak, but I don't understand. Does, shouldn't it have said he he answered both of their prayers? He the, the good translation Yater, he entreated to their their prayers. So they say, well, no, it's really that and it could be the issue was in both, but whose prayer did he listen to? Yitzhak's why very famous line. Okay, the prayer of a tzaddik, the son of a tzaddik, which was Yitzchak, the son of Avram, is stronger than the prayer of a tzaddik ben Rasha, which was Rivka, the son of the daughter of Lavan. Okay, uh, sorry, the daughter of Bituel. So now, Amar Rabbi Yitzchak, Mipne ma'ayu avotenu akurim. By the way, I assume they think Bituel is a Rasha because of Lavan, right? They assume the family wasn't great. Okay, um, so now, Amar Rabbi Yitzchak. I see someone, I'm trying to follow a little bit the chat, but I see that you were saying about the, um, the that Rivka was three years old. So first of all, remember, we saw Drush out that maybe she was 12 and that that's not why necessarily he waited, right? There's different opinions about how old Rivka was. So that's not a clear proof. And then that, that, that's why he waited the 10 years. One could claim that, but they don't claim that here, which means they probably didn't think she was three years old. Very famous line. Also, why are, why were our forefathers, right? Many of them were barren. God wants the prayers of our fathers, right? He wants to hear Tzadikim's prayers. It's a very hard concept to understand, but right, it's that God wants, maybe it's a way to bring them closer to God. So because of that, they have to go through suffering. It's a, the basic question also of Tzadik Beralo. Vayeatel comes from the root of Etel. Eter is a pitchfork. So why is it coming from the same language as a pitchfork? Ma, and what did they use the pitchfork for? For zore, for winnowing. They would pick up all the grains and then all the chaff would fall and the, the chaff would kind of blow away and the wheat would fall into a pile. So the, the um, garinim, the seeds. So now they say, ma eter zema pechat huami makom la makom. What does it do? It blows the grains from place to place. Okay, so the tefilot of tzaddikim turns the midot of God, it moves everything around from being angry at us to basically being, uh, having rachamim, having empathy for us and sympathy. This is a very strange line. Avraham v'sarat tumtumim hayu. They were both tumtumim. What is a tumtum? And that's why couldn't they have children? Because their, their private parts were sealed. If this is where we don't know if they're male or female because the private parts are sealed. Shenema, how do we get this? Habitu el tzul, habitu el tzul, chut sabten, ve'el makevet bor nukalten. Okay, this is a pasuk from Yeshayahu. So it says, you're, it's not an androgynous. An androgynous has both simanim of male and female. This is a tumtum, which we don't know whether they're male or female. So what does this say? Look to the rock from where you were hewn. And the hole of the pit where you were dug from. So now, what is that's the next pasuk? We're basically saying the rock where you were hewn was Avraham, meaning he was a rock that was kind of sealed up and it then was hewn out and God cured him from being a tum tum. And Sarah was the Makevet Bor Nukartem. You were dug out from. Again, it wasn't clear that she was female and only later was her situation fixed. Okay, it's a bit of a strange, right? Whether this is meant to be understood literally, I don't think so, but what, what's the idea that you come out of this? Well, it was an amazing miracle that she was able to have children, right? And that he was able to have children. It, it, was, it was something that clearly they couldn't have done without God's intervention. 
Amar Rav Nachman Amar Rav 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 Sarah Imenu Ailonit Taita a different version that she was an Ailonit okay which means right she never really developed um, properly Shenema Vati Sarah Akara Ein Lavlad why did it say Akara Ein Lavlad we know Akara means Ein Lavlad Akara means she was buried so obviously she had never child Afilu Beit Vlad Ein Lav okay she didn't even have a womb you know people say it's obviously it means she had a womb first of all we were told. Remember that Sarah stopped having Kaora Hanashim, right? She's already stopped having her period. So it doesn't seem to make sense that she wouldn't have had a womb. How could she have had menstruation before that? So it obviously must mean that it was very small, right? It was more like a child's womb, like an Ilonit's womb. Again, these are dress shown on the Psukim, not necessarily meant to be understood literally, but again, it's trying to say the miraculous nature of how God intervened and resolved the situation. And maybe possibly it's giving hope to people who are in difficult situations that. God can change anything, basically. Right, in light of modern, you know, medicine, you can see how, right, it's, it's, you know, God enabling us to be able to do these amazing things nowadays, that there are many solutions, thank God, for issues like this. Um, this 10-year thing is only in those days. Remember people in the beginning of Sefer Bresh, it lived hundreds and hundreds of years. So 10 years in a life of hundreds of years, right, is a lot of time. But in our short lifespan, it's, it's actually a really long time. So he says, Nowadays, we live a lot less. We come up with this amount, three pregnancies, two and a half years. Okay, two and a half years is 30 months, so it's not really three pregnancies, it's nine, right? It's really should be 27 months. Either you say the rabbi's round, which we see that many times, or you could say that maybe some people claim it's three pregnancies plus a month in between to kind of get out of, right, your tame after, even though it's all potentially, but that you would then add a month to each one. But either way, two and a half years for, you know, okay, you missed three potential opportunities to get pregnant, even though it's not really true that you missed, right? Because anyway, it's just like symbolic. Or Rabbi Amar Rav Nachman, he says in the name of Rav Nachman, Shalosh Anim Kegenga Shalosh Pekidot. What are Pekidot? Dama Mar, Baruch Hashanah, Nifkidu Sarah Rachel Vachana. Right, and this is why we read the section about Sarah having a baby, Am Rosh Hashanah, and um, Chana, we also read Am Rosh Hashanah. They were answered on Rosh Hashanah, okay? Also Rachel, they were able to have children, God answered their prayers. So you have to have three years to pass three Rosh Hashanahs. So Rosh Hashanah is your, your big opportunity for God to answer your prayers. So you have to pass three pikido, three options of God answering you. And then you can divorce your wife if you need to. Um, Rabbi, Rabbi says, even though we quoted Rabbi Nachman saying this, and even though there was an opinion before, it said two and a half years, we don't go by this. How do we know we don't go by this? Who established the Mishnah? Rebbe, right? And he said 10 years. David im It says the, the lifespan of man is 70 years. Already then the lifespans were much shorter. So there, and yet they wrote 10 years. So therefore we go by 10 years and we don't go by this uh, change of, of situation. We're now going back to that line that I said could be interpreted in different ways. And they're now going to interpret it as if the reason she doesn't lose her ketuba is because Maybe it's his issue and not her issue. The Dilma Ihi de Lozachia, but how do we know? Maybe it's her issue. So they say no, because Ihi, Kevin de Lome Pata, Periorivia, as we're going to see tomorrow, since she's not commanded for Periorivia to have children, Lomi Ansha, we're assuming, again, I told you before, we're going to view this as a punishment. It must be a punishment to somebody. And whose punishment? That's Mida Kenege Mida, right? We're going to assume it's a punishment for him for not having Periorivia. It's obviously a little counterintuitive, but the point is, we're only going to put it on, we're going to assume the one guilty is the one who's commanded to do the mitzvah and not the woman who's not commanded to do the mitzvah. So now they say, now they're asking another question. Eni, is it really true that the man should divorce his wife and go try to marry someone else and then he'll have children through her? We have a situation where the rabbis told Rabbi Abba Brasav that you're going to recognize this. We had someone asking Rav Shesha the exact same question. We're actually going to see that in a minute. They said to him, go get married and have children. What are you doing not being married? Right? You can see that the rabbis put their faces into people, right? They, com they complain to Ben Azai, they complain to Rav Sheshe about the same thing. They're complaining to Rav Adam. Now we're going to see, uh, Rav Abba Barzabda. we're going to see that he was actually married already. Kind of, maybe he was divorced or maybe his wife died, we don't know. But they said, 
or maybe she couldn't have children, and they said, go marry somebody else. Maybe they were still married. If I was worthy, I would have had from my other wife, okay? My first wife. So basically, he's saying, clearly it's my fault because I didn't have any children with this wife. So why is the Mishnah telling you, go marry someone else? This story seems to contradict. You don't need to marry someone else because if you would have been able to have children, you would have had it with your first wife. Okay, so again, I see you're asking, couldn't he have stayed married? He could have stayed married. We don't know. Maybe he divorced her. Maybe she was dead. Maybe he was still married to her and they were just saying, go take another wife. So they now say, What's, why don't we learn anything from this story? He was just pushing off the rabbis and said, get off my case. Because really, oh no, now we're going to see that Rav Huna affected not only Rav Sheshet, he also affected Rabbi Abba Barzavd. Okay, his long shirim caused Rabbi Abba Barzavd to get sick, that he became uh, infertile. Rav Gidel Iyakar Mipirke de Rafuna. Now we're going to see more rabbis who this happened to. Rabbi Chelvo Iyakar Mipirke de Rafuna. Rav Sheshet, who we saw already, Iyakar Mipirke de Rafuna. Rav Achabrai. Okay, so now we're, we have a list of a bunch of rabbis that, got, that were, had this problem. Rav Achabrai Yaakov Achtete Suskita. He got sick with this disease, Suskinta, which is basically the, this problem where from not going to the bathroom, you become infertile. Tal Yua Be'arza de Be'rav, but he came up with the solution. They hung him, we don't know exactly how they hung him, upside down, right side, I don't know exactly. They hung him from the beam in the Beit Midrash. Okay, you're not going to love the story. Unafak Meneke Utsa Yarka, a green or yellowish substance came, you know, out of his body and he was cured. Okay, so now they say, I'm Rav Yaakov. He now tells the story about it. Sheet in Sabe Havina, we were 60 rabbis who all got this. The Kulu Yaka Mi Pirke Huna. Okay, forget about one, two, three, four that we saw. No, there were 60 rabbis who got sick from this because of Rav Huna extending the length of the shear. Levar Me'ana, other than me. Okay, I fulfilled the Pasuk. If you're smart, you will live through that, right? And that basically he was able to cure himself because he came up with a solution. Okay, so now we end up with um, whether it was really 60, whether it was just exaggerating, we don't really know, but it obviously seems like this was a big problem. Gersha Mutech. Now from here to the end of the daf, and even in tomorrow's, we're going to deal with this concept of chazaka. Chazaka, normally, if I ask you a question, how many times does it take to create a chazaka, right? A chazaka is once something's happened X number of times, we assume it's going to happen again. So um, you would tell me three, because that's usually, but there's actually a very big machloket, and we've seen this a bunch of times, we're going to see it many more times in Shas, machloket, Rebbe, and Rashvag, is it two or is it three? So now, what does this have to do with anything? Because it says in our Mishnah, Gersha Muteret, if he divorces her, she can go marry another person. We don't have to assume it's her problem, but it sounds like Shani inch the Shilo, it only says she can get married once more, doesn't say she can get married a second, a second time after that, meaning a third time. So therefore, they're going to assume Manitimani, who is our mission according to Rebihi, must be Rebi, who says Chazak is created twice. If we're ready, she married two people and couldn't have children, we assume she can't have children. It's her problem. So that must follow Rebi. Ditanya, a different case. If you give a Brit Milah, there's an assumption that if a child died from a Brit Milah, he continually bled. And then you have another child who does it. The question is, is it two, after two children, do you already not give a Brit Milah to your third child because maybe they'll die from the Brit Milah? Or do you have to wait till the fourth child and create a Chazaka with three? So, if you give a Brit Milah the first and he dies, Shani Vamet, the second one also, Shlishi Lo Tamul Divrei Rebbe, Rebbe says, don't give a Brit Milah to this third one because you already created a Chazaka that your children's blood doesn't, um, you know, won't stop. The, the blood is very thin. So now they say, right, the third one you can give a Brit Milah to, but the fourth one you don't. Peter, you're asking an excellent question, which is, um, which is basically, here you're talking about life and death, and you would think that that's much more serious and we'd be more stringent, meaning create chazaka too. But for some reason, they don't say that, although we are going to distinguish at the end of the daf between different cases we're going to hold like different people. We'll get back to that. So now um, the Gemara says, wait a minute. Doesn't it say the opposite? The Rebbe says three and Rashbad says two. We have a contradiction between traditions. So they say, well, which one was last? So they say, well, let's learn from here. Tashma. Rabbi Rabbi Yochanan is going to give a case that happened with Rabbi Shem ben Gamliel. Rabbi Yochanan is already in the Tukhanim Ha'orim. Rashbag was earlier. The assumption is this must have been much later. If Rabbi Yochanan was alive when Rashbag was there, it must have been a much later tradition. 
So, right, it must have been the end of Rashbag's life, and then that would prove it. Maseba Arba Achayot Bitsipori. There were four sisters. Now we're going to learn a different case of the Brit Milah. So each sister had a child who died. Not that I had three children, but each sister had a child who had a Brit Milah and died from it. Maseba Arba Achayot Bitsipori. Shema Larishon Avamech, Niavamech, Lishit Vamech. So three sisters ended up with, with children who died. Rivi'id ba lifnei Ram Shem ben Gamliel. The fourth one goes before Ram Shem ben Gamliel and says, do I have to do this? Amar la al-tamuli. He said no. So there you can prove he must hold chazak at three. So Gemara says that's not a proof at all. And again, if Rabbi Yochanan's quoting this, it must be at the end of his life, which must mean this is the latest Masoret, which means this is the case. They say, don't yat yesh lishit. Now have an amar Only the fourth one came to ask him. Maybe the third one had asked him. He would have said, also don't do it. It was only she didn't ask. So they say, well, if that's the case, then in Kim, I asked to do Rabbi Chiyabrava, then why is Rabbi Chiyabrava even bringing this? He's obviously bringing it because he wants to teach us halacha. So it must be that because the fourth one asked, that's the reason why Rashbad said it. But if the third one had asked, he would have said no. You know, he would have said, you have to go ahead with it. So they say no. Maybe he wants to teach us. Maybe the, the point is that you would have thought only if it's one person with all their sons. Even sisters can create a chazak here. And that was the chiddush. The, the concept is that sisters can create a chazak. So I'm a Rava. Rava now just has a comment about this. He now says two things, basically. Number one, some people think he thinks that everyone agrees when it comes to sisters that it's three and not two. Okay, because it's already a little more distant. And they say you shouldn't marry someone who has history of epilepsy in the family or leprosy in the family because you can, excuse me, you can assume that your children are going to have it also. Okay, this is, you know, we all know about hereditary diseases. So at three, you can create a chazaka with a family with, a, with an issue like this. My Havela. So we didn't really get an answer though. Which who says what? So Rebbe says, so right, Rebbe, does Rebbe say two or three? Does Rashbad say two or three? Who says what? Ki answer of Yitzhak by Yosef Amr. Uv to have a commander of Yachan, but Knisha de Maon, but Yom Kippurim Shaliopa Shabbat. So Rabbi Yochanan says there was a case that happened in the in the Beit Knesset of Maon. Okay, Shuli Mishkin wrote this week about Maon in flashback. What, where is Ma'on? She gives three different possibilities and she talks about also other sources that talk about things that they brought up in this Beit Knesset in, Ma, in Ma, Ma'on. It was obviously an important central Beit Knesset. So now they say, this, ha- this incident happened in Yom Kippurim that was on Shabbat. It was Yom Kippur, it was Shabbat, they were doing Brit Milah. The Brit Milah, right, overrides if, if it's supposed to override. So what happened? Malo Rishon Avamech, Niavamech, the Shipa, the Fanav, Amarli, Lechimuli. Okay, so the first one died, the second one died, the third one died. Unclear, by the way, different sources say different things. Some try to prove it's clear we're talking about the same person. Some will say it's clear we're talking about sisters. We don't know if it was the same mother and it was triplets or if it was um, sisters, but three of them died. And then what happened? Um, the, right then, sh- sorry, two of them died. The third one came and he said, go do the Brit Milah. So I'm like, buy it. Okay, which they would then show, right, that we hold. And the question is, what do we hold? We hold chazak is three and not two. And even in a case like you asked before, even in a case where it's a risk of death. And not only that, but even on Yom Kippur, Shabbat, where if you're not obligated, it actually will be chilu. And in fact, Abaye questions this and says, I'm really Abaye. Chazay de kashari isura v'sakanta. You're doing two things here. You're allowing something that might potentially be forbidden because it's Shabbat and Yom Kippur. If you're not obligated, you can't do it. And number two, you're, you're, getting into a case of sakana, danger, someone's life. Despite that he complains about this, okay, and this is very interesting in and of itself, despite that he was questioning this and that maybe in a case of death, he himself, okay, very fascinating, he himself married this woman, Chuma, who was the daughter of Isi, the daughter of Rabbi Yitzchak, who was the son of Rabbi Yehuda. This is what we call an Isha Katlan. It's like a, like a black widow, right? Kills whoever she mates. So what happened? She married Rechava Pobedita and he died. She married him and he died. And Abai married her and he died as well. Okay, so here was interesting. You said, why are you putting this baby at risk? And then he himself put himself at risk by marrying this woman. Amarava. How could he have done this? He's the one who said, 
Avin de Samcha, Yitzchak Sumak, Allah bar Samcha. It's who, what was he relying on? He was obviously relying on the Psak, this situation that Rabbi Yitzchak, Bar Yosef, explained that Rabbi Yochanan allowed this child to have a Brit Milah, right? And said, give the child a Brit Milah. We own Chazak is only three. Now, if you're saying that Abai relied on him, Abai himself says we don't rely on Rabbi Yitzchak. They call him Yitzchak Sumaka, the, the red. It must be must have been redhead. Okay. Well, we rely on Avin's traditions, and Avin must have had a different tradition than Rabbi Yochanan. Avin, so they and why is that? Because Avin Yeshna Bahazara, Yitzhak Sumaka Eno Bahazara. That could be explained in different ways. Maybe he reviewed a lot of what Rabbi Yochanan said many times and therefore he knew it better, or he returned to Israel and therefore knew it better, as opposed to the other one who didn't return to Israel. Anyway, different explanations about for whatever reason he was. And number two, they might disagree when it comes to Brit Milah, but who says they disagree when it comes to marriage? Maybe they all agree when it comes to marriage. So now they say, no, they disagree with marriage as well. How do we know this? They do. Rebbe says, if already two husbands of hers died, you don't marry her. Third one, yes, the fourth one, not. So, so now I say, wait a minute. I understand the logic by Brit Mila. Some people have thin blood, some people have thick blood. Okay, that, that's a family thing. It could be hereditary. But, Ellen, he's suing my time up, but what's the deal with a woman who's, right, that they call an Isha Katlani? Uh, what's the connection of her killing her husband? It doesn't make any sense. So I'm going to have more to Rabbi Ashi, Haki, I'm Rabbi Mimi Hagron, Yemish Meda Rabuna, Mayan Gorin. Okay, could be having intercourse with her, could cause, right? Either a sexually transmitted disease or something like that. That could potentially cause, and that's why she might be a woman who's killing her husband, right? Not intentionally, but it could be. Rabbi Ashi, I'm Ramazal Gorin. It could be she just has bad luck, right? And therefore, don't marry a woman with bad luck. What's the Nafkamina Benayo? My Benayo, what's the difference? Iki Benayo, the Irso Mate, or Inami, the Nafami, the Lake O Mate, me Dikla Mate. If the husbands died, if after they were only betrothed and then they didn't have relations, and it's clearly not, if the issue is they were worried it was transmitted through intercourse, well, obviously there was no intercourse and therefore we assume not. Or if he fell off a, a, a tree and died, right? That it had absolutely nothing to do with anything having to do with her or some disease or something. Then clearly, again, if you say it's from Azal, well, that could be her luck, okay? This is obviously a difficult issue. My, my grandmother had two husbands who died and this happens to many people. Um, and you know, she didn't get married, um, remarried in the end anyway, but you know, it's, it definitely is something that comes up a lot and, you know, she did not get married for halakhic reasons, you know, but, um, but there's uh, an issue about this, right? Do we hold by this? Do we not hold by this? Right. How far do we take it? Um, anyway, it's a, it's a, it's a relevant topic and a difficult one. So I'm going to have Yosef Bure de Ravala Rava. By me name of Yosef Halachaki Rebbe. He asked him, is the halacha like Rebbe that it's two? I'm going to eat. Then he asked him, that it's three. So he says, are you, right? It's like, which way do you go? And you say that way, right? Because how can we hold a kim and how can we hold a kim? That's, you asked in a very stam way, but I'll explain it to you, okay? When it comes to marriage, this is where we saw it right now. Some people say it's an Ishaq Adanit. Some people say it's our Mishnah. Can she marry a third person after not having children? And Malkuyot, we hold like Rebbe, the two. Veston, Chormuad, Kiram Shim, and Gambia. We'll end here, and tomorrow we'll explain what all these cases are, and then maybe we'll come up with, you know, why we hold like one in one case and one in another case. Okay, we'll stop here for today. Uh, have a good day, everyone. And tomorrow, as promised, we'll get to the mitzvah of Kiriyah Rivia by women. Okay, are they truly exempt? Uh, we will see. Have a good day, everyone.